both sides. Um, and there isn't a single um, satisfactory answer. But to some degree, I would say, the, uh, the argument between depth of training uh, first, understand some approaches deeply. You need to do that before you can integrate. <coughs> the problem is that way of understanding deeply may be understanding deeply because you've dug yourself into a hole. Uh, you know, you get stuck in a set of assumptions that don't allow you to see out. You're down there in that hole and you look up and everything you see, you're surrounded by the assumptions of that theory. I would say another way to think about understanding deeply is that if you are from the very beginning studying different points of view in a way that is confronting how they are challenged by other points of view, then instead of getting stuck in, um, and I, I wrote down somewhere a, a note of, about it, and I'm, I'm trying to remember exactly how I had uh, phrased it. You know, the, the, the getting stuck in both the jargon of a particular viewpoint and the sort of the received wisdom of that viewpoint is not necessarily learning in depth. I mean, I, I, I can think of conversations I've had with, say, Kleinian analysts in which it is very, very hard to see the world through any filter other than the paranoid and depressive position. And everything gets assimilated into that. And then even if they are integrating other things, they're integrating them in, in such a way that it kind of gets shredded through their way of viewing things so that it's chop me rather than something that's you know, organized, organic, coherent. Whereas if we ask what's the wisdom, what's the value, what are the actual clinical observations on which these views are based. But we're asking it not down in that hole of we've only learned this system and only then do we try to find a way to climb back out of it. But if we're learning things from the beginning in relation to other things, it enables a kind of challenging that we don't ordinarily do, especially in the psychoanalytic world, but I've been noticing it increasingly in the cognitive behavioral world and in uh, emotion-focused therapies and in a host of other approaches. Things get organized around authorities, around gurus, around leaders, uh, and everybody sees things through that filter and then it really becomes hard to integrate. So that in the, in the end, I, I sort of think about, uh, I'm always humiliated even to hear people apologize, uh, Danny apologizing for his accent. And here he is competently speaking another language, and I've never developed that competence. Uh, but I have developed the competence to have an accent. I have an accent in my practice of psychotherapy. When I do cognitive behavior therapy, I do it with a psychoanalytic accent. When I do psychoanalysis, I do it with a cognitive behavioral accent. And I'm proud of my accent. I'm proud of not speaking it perfectly, but speaking it in the hybrid way. And as we proceed through it, what I will try to illustrate to you is my accent in a certain sense. So I'll stop there. That's a lot to respond to because you made a lot of interesting uh, points. Um, so, some of what um, 
uh, your, your, of what your comment reminds me of is of, of what was sort of listed in the program as the title of my presentation and something that Sharon had highlighted, which is the difference between um, integrative psychotherapy and uh, psychotherapy integration, the process or the product. And I think that if we think about the integrative psychotherapist um, and what he or she is engaged in, uh, what we notice is that there is never going to be an, a, a single integrative model because even if it looked like there might be such a model, and we're nowhere close to that yet. Each individual therapist is going to be creating their own version of it. Because in order to be an effective psychotherapist, you have to speak from, with, with your own integrity, from your own personal voice. And in doing that, you're creating a somewhat different version. So. Uh, I, I think the idea that it's, oh, there's always that process going on, even if you think you have an integrative model. I'm really glad that you, you did introduce that, because I think, I think it, it has been left out and is really important. Um, especially because we, we operate in a realm where we are dealing with delicate, value-laden human experiences. I, I think in some way our field was, was both aided and led astray by the analogy to medicine. Um, you know, it was aided because it probably helped our incomes all in all, you know, to have it be treated sort of like we're, we're doctors who are curing illnesses and so on. But we pay a high price for that because even though there are value issues in medicine too, certainly, and questions about what is health and illness that keep coming up and are important to come up, it's so much more the case in what we do that we are in the realm of how should one live <coughs> one's life, really? And what are the foundations and assumptions by which we live one's life? And the psychotherapist is challenged in all sorts of ways. And again, to um, try to repeat uh, Ilanit's rep repetition of my invitation, um, I do want to be sure that in the course of our discussion we get to some of these challenges because, for example, around issues like how directive should the therapist be? How much should the therapist be concerned with what the person is doing in his or her daily life? How should we deal with the patient doing things that challenge our values. Uh, some we can easily say, well, it's not my place to judge, but what if the, we're working with a patient who is causing really serious harm to another person? Is it appropriate for us to just be neutral and non-judgmental? There are a great many value challenges in our work. And these questions, I think as soon as somebody is th trying to think on the one hand, psychoanalytically, interpretively, humanistically, experientially, and on the other hand, systemically or behaviorally, uh, trying to change systems, we are caught in a set of contradictions, dilemmas, that need to be thought about, including very much their value dimensions. So I, I, I think that really is a central part of what we need to think about, and hopefully will also stimulate 
those of you to kind of be sensitive to your own concerns, value concerns often, because there are value demands on both sides that hopefully will at least initially make you uncomfortable with some of what I and other people here are proposing, so that if you're finally going to be comfortable with it, and of course it's my hope that you'll be very comfortable with the way I think. That's why people stand up here and talk in a, through a microphone. But I, I, I will be very unhappy if what happens is people are kind of silently thinking, oh yeah, but that's manipulative or, oh yeah, that's superficial, or, oh yeah, but that's just his idea and there's not enough research evidence for it, or whatever your reservations might be, if you have them privately but they're not coming up in our dialogue, that will upset me. Uh, if we have a dialogue and I try to persuade you and you still walk out unconvinced, I'll feel much better about that. So I, I offer that invitation once more. <laughs> Again, I, th I think you're raising two very, very important themes. I'll, res I'll try to respond quickly to, to, to both. Let me start with the second. Uh, you know, the question came up earlier of uh, would we reach a point where psychotherapy became outmoded, where there, there, there is no more psychotherapy. The way I would ideally like to see that happen, though I don't think it's likely, but I'd like to see it at least reduce, in a sense, is if we used our skills for prevention of the problems we face, it's much better to prevent the problems than to sit in our offices and wait for them to happen and then cure them, so that efforts to think about the, the broader applications of the knowledge we are gaining in order to prevent problems, I, I think would, is, is something we should be doing more of, as much of as we can, though we'll never totally prevent them, obviously. The question of the milieu is even more complicated in the sense that, as you've probably already gathered, I believe that there, is, there are no facets of the personality that are not in some way responsive to the contexts we live in. And in that sense, the milieu we live in is always crucial. And efforts, you know, even again preventive efforts, also include, for example, social changes that can make sometimes more of an impact on mental health than 10,000 psychotherapies going on. You know, the, the milieu creates certain changes. But the milieu also raises problems in the, in the sense that when I first began to be interested in integrating behavioral work and psychoanalytic work, one of the first, I, uh, the first formulation for me of where it could and could not work was I could see integrating, for example, as very readily interpersonal and later relational models of psychoanalysis and forms of behavior therapy that were, for example, related to exposure models that reduced anxiety and could contribute uh, ultimately even to the diminishing of defensiveness, which is, after all, just a, an avoidance response to anxiety. There was a lot of possibilities of integrating those. I had a much harder time thinking about how more classical Freudian theories and Skinnerian behavioral models could fit together. But as I thought about it further, you know, these things sort of further differentiated so that I began to think that, for example, on the one hand, one of the ways in which Skinner's work has been seriously misunderstood, because he's often just presented as a kind of almost proto-fascist manipulator, um, 
there are ways in which Skinner is oddly similar to Carl Rogers and to the most humane forms of humanistic and psychoanalytic therapy in that the Skinnerian notion of shaping is really can be understood as take people where they are. Don't try to get a person from here to here when it's really not going to be possible for them to have anything other than a failure experience. Help them get from here to here, just a slight bit. Once they're there, they're more able to move the next slight bit, and so on. And a lot of the Skinnerian notion of shaping, and we may get a chance to talk about this more through the conference, can be translated into the language of take people where they're at and start from there. On the other hand, speaking of jails or closed mental hospitals or other such sort of more total institutions and the use of token economies, for example, those become more problematic for me. And again, for value issues, as, as Yoel was introducing, because they depend on our having total control over the person and simply dispensing the reinforcements as the authority. And that I'm much more uncomfortable with and to have much less of a vision of how that can be integrated with the other sides of my vision or role as a psychotherapist. So even something like, you know, Skinnerian operant conditioning, there were versions of it I can imagine integrating, and there were versions of it that I can't. So all of these introduce additional complexities all the time. And as long as we stay confused, we're in good shape. Yeah.